Welcome to the latest episode of The State of Mirrorless, our series of video interviews with uh, photographers and industry experts who use mirrorless camera systems. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Nathan Wright. Uh, Nathan is, a, I think, it, you, I can define you as an audiophile and photophile. This is how you define yourself on your website, um, homeimage.net, which is a blog that deals with uh, uh, photography products and uh, also audio products if you're interested in, in that kind of, uh, of products. Today, of course, we are going to, to talk about cameras because uh, uh, Nathan's uh, main uh, uh, job is that of a photographer, if I'm, if I'm right. So, and, and Nathan is based in, in Japan. Yes. So, um, what, what time is it there, Nathan? It's now almost half past 10 in the evening, or 22, 23, if you're on military time. Yeah. So it's a bit late for you, so thanks for taking the time to, to be Not here. at all. So Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Did I introduce you correctly, or want, do you want to say a bit more about you, your life, uh, why you decided to, to move to Japan? Uh, and what are your interests in, in photography at the moment? Okay, well, first, I think whenever someone introduces me, or the first time we chat, that person must know that there are two things about me that are more important than anything else. One is the fact that I don't consider beer to be alcohol, um, but I drink it. Uh, second, that my coffee always has something like Kahlua or Bailey's in it. Uh, both of those are alcohol related. But back on topic, uh, yes, I'm a photographer based, um, I used to be in Chiba, I am now, which is just north of uh, Tokyo. I'm now in a province called Ibaraki, which is just a little bit north of Chiba. I have a studio there and I shoot 90% audio devices, things like amplifiers, DACs, headphones, earphones, internet interconnect cables, um, I spend most of my time in a dark room and have the perplex. Uh, per I, I have this the skin of a vampire essentially. I never get outside. So, <laughs> do, do you do you ever go outside to, to take photographs or? No, that's it. That's it. Uh, my hobbies are bicycling and uh, hiking. And so whenever my wife and I go hiking and bicycling, I'm always slathering on the uh, the sun sun protection liquid. Or what what do you call it? Uh, sunscreen. Sunscreen. And uh, yeah, yeah, doing a lot of hiking, doing a lot of bicycling. But uh, I I have I really I literally have the perplexion of a Smurf, so uh, I have to be very careful. Mm. But yes, I, I do go outside, but it's it's always to do my hobbies. I, do, I don't do in terms of photography. Um, I love landscape. I don't think I'm a good landscape photographer. Um, but when I have the chance to, I do. And I used to, when I lived in Seoul, I used to do street, what I considered street photography. But I don't think I'm a good street photographer. OK. Um, so you, you should this, I, I imagine it's a very high-end audio equipment, audio uh, Some of it, yeah. Mm. So, so, yeah. Mm. So go, going back to, to, to photography and to what interests more our, our listeners probably, they would like to know what do you use for your job? Okay, well that's uh, an excellent question. Um, I, I am 100% mirrorless now, um, which I think will probably make some of the listeners uh, of, of your channel be very happy. But yeah, I'm, I'm another one of those people that abandoned uh, mirrored cameras um, about a year ago. Actually. A little bit more than a year ago, I picked up uh, some mirrorless stuff. Um, and actually, before then, I was actually I owned the um, Nikon D eight hundred, and that was in terms of in terms of the output, very very good camera, but very very hard um, to do the work that I do with the D eight hundred. Mainly because I work completely macro, almost I would say ninety five percent with a macro lens. Um, often doing stacking, and the D800's live view was very poor. Um, eventually, I upgraded to this, the uh, Sony A7R, which 
is a love and hate relationship for me. Um, but it has a very, very good live view. And for most of my work, this is perfectly fine. Um, up to prints, I've seen my um, stuff that I've done up to two meters wide. Uh, perfectly fine. And when I'm doing events with models, etc., I use this, uh, what is this, Fujifilm X-T1. And also, I use the X100S. And those are my three cameras. However, uh, when I'm doing an expensive shoot, I generally rent um, a phase one camera. Or phase one back, sorry. But still, that's that's uh, mirrorless for me. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's what I would have imagined. That m most of the people I've interviewed for this series, they they mention the fact that they like to use mirrorless cameras because they are small and lightweight. So their backpack weighs a lot, a lot less, and they're able to to track uh, easier, to 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 track longer, to go to places where they would uh, they were used to to carrying a, a lot of stuff in their backpack now their backs are feeling much better because they they are carrying much less weight but in your case you're you're shooting in a studio most of the time so that that doesn't really apply but well, you still find good quality uh with for instance with the sony enough resolution for that kind of job which i i think is very demanding in terms of resolution and sharpness oh, absolutely those are those are absolutely um paramount of importance for my, my work. But uh, the, the, ma the main thing literally is the quality of live view. And also another thing that changed things for me is Wi-Fi. Um, a lot of people I've noticed on certain forums are like, we don't want a camera with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is, is not uh, pure enough photography for us. That's, I don't know, too much, too much technology or whatever. But I am um, for me, having the camera be able to forward a, 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 a live preview of the image I'm going to take to a smart device like a, a phone or a tablet because uh, it's very important because I take the tablet around the studio whilst I move reflectors, whilst I move my, um, my lights. Um, I, I work by myself. <laughs> so having something where I can preview the image I'm going to take before I take it and wherever I am in the studio is very important. And I couldn't do that with the D800 unless I used uh, something like a Cam Ranger. Um, and still, that was very poor quality. The A700, or the, sorry, the A7R really changed that because it provided a very high quality uh, preview of whatever I was going to take. And that is what it is. So I've seen a lot of photographers in the studio uh, shooting in tethered mode. So they would plug a right. cable into the camera and the USB end into a desktop or laptop computer and use that to to assess the quality of images immediately after they've been taken but it, right. it looks like with the with the wi-fi capabilities of the sony you went a step behind beyond that in that you're able to to judge the quality of the the, expo the exposure and the sharpness even before taking the shot so you're not missing being able to shoot tethered Actually, it's it's a slightly different. So I will focus prior to moving around the studio. So I will focus. I will first. What I do when I take an item is let's say it's uh, let's say it's this MP3 player, um, for instance. I'm gonna whip it out of its case here. This is an iRiver AK100. It's a $700 MP3 player. This MP3 player, I would I would turn in my hands. I would look at the important parts of the device. Decide what's the best reflection. What are the important parts? then decide on an angle to take it with. And then once I've decided the angle, then I would set up the camera, the lens, um, all the focus parameters before moving around the studio. After that, then I would take my smart device with a preview from a Wi-Fi image, already, already perfectly focused, and then I would move the reflectors and the lights so that I would get the right reflection in the right place. You know how they have, um, a lot of times, you have that sharp reflection, like a black, and a cut to white. That's all done with card and with certain um, sharp metallic devices, which just cut it off. It's not you can do it um, in post processing, but I prefer to do it with um, with something in the studio because um, it looks more realistic. So all of that would not be possible had I done it tethered, because tether would require me to re, re um, to remove myself back to the laptop. 
to see what I was doing. Whereas if I have Wi-Fi, I carry the device with me and there's no cables to trip over. And I decide, ah, if I change this reflector like this, the reflection changes like this and the final image will, I, I can assume what the final image will be. Yeah. Tethered would not work for what I do. I see, I see, very, very good. So you, you mostly use the, the Sony to, to shoot products, and you also said you use the, the Fuji X-T1 for, for models. Is there a specific reason why you're not using the Sony for everything? Yeah, the, the Sony is uh, is loud as hell. It goes, when I when I hit the shutter button, it, uh, let, me, let me, maybe I can click it here next to the microphone. Yeah. Takes forever for this bloody thing to turn on. That's another reason I don't use it. But, it's it's way too loud. It's loud. It's slow. It's um, it's more obnoxious than my D eight hundred ever was in terms of using it in front of people. Because the D eight hundred would go clap, and the A seven hundred goes clack clack, or clack 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 for one single exposure. And the um, the XT one, for example, let me see, is a lot quieter. So I just click that. Um, and it's also, I turn it on and it's on within less than a second. It's almost, it's almost like using a film version of a DSLR. It's, it's the same size of a film camera. It's not that much slower than a DSLR. It's just, and it's, it looks better than the A7R. So I, I noticed that when you showed your cameras, it, seemed, it looks like you have some interesting lenses mounted on those. Oh, right, right, right. Are they like Fuji or Sony lenses, am I right? Uh, so I do have one native lens, and that is the, for the Fujifilm X-T1, and that is the X35 1.4. Mm -hmm. But I don't, my, my wife uses that. Actually, it's not, it's not mine. Uh, we replaced her Nikon D5000 with uh, the, actually, she, she, uses, she uses this camera more than I do. Um, but I use um, generally adapted lenses. Um, my my favorite current lens for the that I use on the XT1 is actually an old Olympus Pen F lens, which is a 61.5, which I guess would equate in full frame terms to 92.2 or something like that. So it's reasonably fast, um, decent quality, decent amount of out of focus elements being really out of focus, um, and reasonably sharp. But everything I use is adaptive. Not a single lens I use um, professionally is for that native mount. Yeah. I guess that that's not a problem for products that don't move much, so you can not at all. No. Time to, to manually focus, but you don't have any issues with uh, manual focus uh, with models or if you're moving around. No, 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 not at all. Um, but. Even before I was using mirrorless cameras, I used only, um, on the Nikon, I, I used only AI lenses and AIS lenses, and also pre-AI lenses. So um, the AF, I did use AF for a while, and that was only when I did sports photography for a couple of studios here in Japan. Um, but generally, I was using AI lenses. So I have, I, I've been manual focused since the very beginning of my commercial career, I guess, except for when I did sports. So what are your favorite lenses? Maybe the My favorite lens? Mm, yeah. more often. OK, so for my work, actually, let's see, where is it? It's somewhere around the computer. <laughs> ah, here it is. Uh, let me grab it. Uh, right now, I haven't finished the review of it. Uh, so generally, I use a Bellows. And this is the Novaflex Ball Pro TS, um, which, is, which is basically, it covers up to six, the, the image circle, as long as your lens covers it, um, will cover up to a six by nine uh, medium format camera or a uh, film, film size. Um, it extends for macro. And, uh, but on it, I put a, a number of different lenses currently. It is attached to a Fujifilm uh, 90 f5.6 EX lens, which is a lens from, I think, the 1980s. It cost me about $70 or 40 quid or so. And by the way, it has made many, 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 many thousands of dollars for magazines and uh, 
for other stuff. So it's uh, 70 bucks well spent. It's a tiny little lens. I'll grab it here. It's inside of this, this adapter that NovaFlex made. Let me unscrew it. It uses an M39 mount. It's this, this, this tiny little thing. Cool. Awesome. You're, you're showing us things that most people would never even imagine they exist. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just great. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's one of the lenses that I use. Um, generally, for magazines, I use this lens um, because I, for most of my photography, literally, um, until I use, when I shoot models, I'm generally shooting uh, about 85 millimeters full frame. But when I'm shooting anything else, I use um, about 90 to 100 millimeter full frame. And so the other lens I use mainly is uh, a Schneider uh, macro 100 5.6 lens. It's it also covers up to four by five. Um, it very very sharp. A little bit more expensive. Um, easy to clean. Works very well on the Sony, especially. Um, um, just very easy to use, and it also works perfectly with the Ball Pro by just clipping it in like that, tightening the um, the uh, the lateral flanges works perfect for, for macro. You see there's a lot of extension there. And it's uh, very sharp for both infinity and macro distances. Um, of course, it's not a very good portrait lens because the bokeh is a little bit, uh, it's got a lot of onions and rings in it. But close up and the sort of photography that I do, it's perfect. And what do you have on the other side of that bellows? Oh, right. On the other side of the lane um, is an adapter. So NovaFlex make a number of adapters for pretty much any camera that's in existence. Um, this one currently is, a, is for a Nex, for Sony Nex or FE or EF or whatever they call it now. Um, and that can be unclipped from the, the NovaFlex. Um, there's like a, a torsional screw adapter here in which you place a Canon or a Nikon or a whatever adapter. And uh, on here is a slide adapter where you can, you can get, uh, you can move the, the, the sensor left or right or up or down to make a panorama or to get just a higher amount of megapixel output for a single image. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, this is what I use. Um, I'm actually in the middle of still reviewing this, um, hopefully to get the review out uh, by the end of this week. But uh, this is a, an item that I pretty much I will be um, replacing my 4x5 camera with. Um, yeah. I'll be buying it at the end of the review as well. That's cool. And what kind of lighting do you use? Do you use uh, strobes, continuous lighting? OK, so most of the photography I do for the clients that I have, um, most of the clients I ask um, that that employ me ask for a certain type of, either they ask for the, like the sort of apple, you know, white on white with reflection on the bottom. And that sort of thing requires studio strobes. Well, you can do it with small strobes as well. Um, as long as you have the right reflectors and the right backlighting, you can, you don't have to have expensive lighting, but I use uh, Profoto, uh, what's the name of the, the lights? Uh, Profoto Pro B head, and I use the, 1200, I forget the name of the generator, but I have two large generators and then a trigger light. I use, generally use anywhere, anywhere between four to six lights for whatever I'm doing, sometimes less. And then if I'm using models, um, if I'm shooting models, uh, I do it very, very simply only because I, I guess we've all seen a lot of like really good crisp model shots, people like, uh, I think, what's his name? Chris Hardy at Deep Review. He, he's a Fujifilm photographer. Um, a lot of people that do sort of crisp model photography. I'm the type of person that likes the, the washed out, flary sort of thing that some people really hate. So when I shoot models, I like to use a reflector and maybe one external flash, and that's it. Yeah, very simple. 
Do Very you simple. Have those, yeah. uh, flashlights or small flashes. So at the moment, at the moment, I am um, so for if I'm outside using a flash, there's sometimes that I will use like a uh, Profoto light, but generally I use a large Profoto reflector with a, a Nikon flash, and then just some I will soften the flash either with a reflector or through some sort of mesh or something like that. Good, very very, very interesting. <laughs> Is there anything that you miss from your? DSLR days, uh, the current systems are not able to to give you. Or not you know, it, it's such an an excellent question. Only because I do not like any modern digital cameras so much. Um, I use mirrorless only because they're easier for my work. But I do not actually like I do not actually like using the XT1 very much. Um, and A7R, the only thing I like about it is the output. Um, and the reason is, it just seems that there's so much, so many layers of um, interface in between the photographer and the final image. So necessarily, when you when you have a mirrorless camera that has no mirror, until you turn the camera on, it, the camera can do nothing at all. You can't even preview possibly what an image might be. Um, what a what an output image. So there's just it's just dead. There's there's nothing there's nothing to look through. And the same thing goes if you attach a mirrorless lens to the camera. The layer, but the mirrorless lens can't even be focused because it's fly by wire until the camera's turned on. And with Fujifilm cameras, until you turn the camera on, the lens is actually. And I'm, I'm sure this is the same for most camera manufacturers out there, mirrorless camera manufacturers out there, that the, the lens is actually at infinity. So you can't even pre-focus or anything until the camera is on, and then you can make all your adjustments. Um, and so I, I really miss direct controls on the lenses. I understand that Fujifilm, they have uh, aperture control, which, of course, doesn't do anything. Um, it just... It's the same thing as one of these rear dials that all the Fujifilm uh, fans are like, well, we have, we have direct controls, which is so much better than unlabeled dials. In effect, you're doing the same exact thing, except that you just have a labeled thing here for the aperture, but that thing isn't doing things. So I miss direct controls. I miss the ability for the camera to hold a charge for weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe months at a time. Um, I also really, really miss looking through the viewfinder and having no lag, having the exact same uh, vision that my eye has. Um, I also have um, a disease known as vertigo. So if, I, if my eye notices any lag in an image, I get sick, literally uh, physically sick. So in EVF, even today's 55 frames per second or 65 frames per second uh, EVFs of the, of the um, XT1 or the A7R, um, if there's any sort of movement, if I pan, I get sick. And with a DSLR, I would never get sick. And the other thing that I miss um, in terms of just, just the, the, the shooting is that when I'm holding the camera uh, with an A7, or sorry, with a D800, for instance, and I would use the same lenses that I'm using on the XT1, the image in the A's, uh, the D800 would pop into focus when I when I focus it, whereas one of these with an EVF, the resolution and the dynamic range and the contrast and and even the, the gaining of the EVF is is so off that my eye cannot detect the smallest smallest details unless I focus in at 100%. So I miss being able to nail something 100% of the time uh, accurately on the first shutter exposure. Um, without any manual aids. Um, apart from that, I hate DSLRs. The current DSLR is absolutely too large. I mean, um, in the 90s, I was using, not professionally, but I was using my father's um, Pentax cameras and my grandfather's Nikon FE and FMs. And they were, you know, same, same exact size as the X-T1, where we think the X-T1 today is so small, but it's the same size as a regular film SLR. But as soon as they became DSLRs, they became massive. And so I, I hate that the, the, the D800 is, is larger than most professional 
film SLR cameras ever, except for a few Nikons. Um, same with same with the D5000, which was considered a small D5 uh, digital DSLR. It's massive. They're heavier. They're they're bulky. They're ugly. They have no form. Yeah. So what I miss is is all what the eye can see. What I don't miss is the fact that DSLRs are just too big. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. So it looks like you're you're you have very strong opinions. Uh, you're not afraid of. You know, no, I'm not. I'm not really a fanboy. Yeah. In public, right? So you're not making many friends in the industry, probably, especially with your blog that I admire. <laughs> you following your blog for a long time. Really? Yeah, okay. Since I started shooting mirrorless myself, and yeah, it's you have strong opinions, and you're not afraid to uh, to to let people know about your opinions. Well, you know, I, I've been. Um, so I started commercial photography in 2007 um, doing, well, I, I drink a lot, just so you know, I drink a lot. Um, so I, I, the first thing I shot was sake and whiskey. And uh, speaking of which, just a, just a, it's not a good beer. It's a black beer. Black beers in, in Japan are generally better than the regular beers, which are shit. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, which are not very good. Um, but I'm, but I started shooting alcohol, and uh, after that, I, I, my, my real hobby was audio. It was a hobby back then, and since then, I'm like, if you get into the audio, if you get into the audio industry, there is opinions are as black and white as they are in like the, the Canon versus the Nikon, the Sony versus the everyone else, the Fujifilm saying that they're better than everything else because they're CFA or whatever. Um, but I, I got into saying I, I didn't like party lines. So if someone, if, if you were a fan of a certain brand of headphone, I didn't like the, fan, the fact that you were a fan for life or whatever. And um, that translated, me, translated into me believing that products can be improved upon. And uh, when I got into the, when I got into reading Deep Review and um, Fuji X4 and, and these other sites, um, mir uh, mirror lessons, etc. You notice that there's people that support each brand, and I like, for instance, with the Fujifilm, I like that you can select before the camera is on that it's easy to tell what shutter speed you'll be using, or if you'll be using an auto uh, automatic aperture or whatever it's called, uh, aperture priority. I like that I can I can tell what ISO I'm using, but there's a whole host of other things that are really getting in the way. Fujifilm make their cameras to look like old cameras, but you cannot use them like old cameras. So I feel that they've gone less than halfway in delivering a product that they feel is good enough for. I don't know who they're marketing to. I think that they're. I think that a lot of these mirrorless cameras are really marketing what they produce to people that have DSLRs, and they're not doing enough different from a DSLR. They're not targeting their audience well enough. And so I get upset at, custom, at companies that don't work hard at marketing their products to the right people. But I like using them for certain reasons. So that's what I talk about. Uh, isn't the X100S a, a bit different in that respect? Doesn't it actually st strive and, and succeed partially in to be being different from a DSLR or, or is it I, just I think, a rangefinder wannabe? Uh, you have so so yeah sure I think overall it's a range I think overall it's a rangefinder wannabe. It's very comfortable to hold if you add a thumbs up grip. It almost feels like you're holding a film camera. But when you, here's where I feel Fujifilm have failed. On the, a, on the X100, if you turn the aperture, you can only change it in full stops. So then you have to use the back wheel to change between third and half stops, which is the same thing as if you're using Nikon. So they broke their interface between two design philosophies, an unlabeled dial, 
and and uh, a ring, and any sort of un uh, any sort of broken interface. I really hate. If you're going to make it one thing, make it fully unlabeled, or make it uh, make it so that you will have half clicks or third stop clicks. So the new XT100, no X100T, seems to be. You know, I, I think they should have done it at the beginning. I don't think they should have released X100 with full stops and then so that you have to change in between half and thirds with a rear bio. And any, any sort of break in the philosophy of the camera is, is a mistake. However... At least they fixed it in the X100T. Yeah, it's 300, it's three years later though. <laughs> it's three years late. I mean, uh, it's, it's a, I'm sure it's a nice camera. I'll actually be checking out tomorrow. I have a, I have a meeting down in Tokyo, so I'll be checking it out. Um, but it's too little. I think it's too little, too late. I think a lot of these cameras, um, as they, they produce a really nice output, but they tend to they market gimmicks that are not fully fleshed out. And uh, so finally, three years, four later, four years later, five years later, they're they're becoming um, mature, which or they seem to be becoming mature, which which is kind of nice, I suppose. But yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that's my thought, I guess, basically. So the perfect camera does not exist. No, maybe not. Um, I, I've got my eyes on um, a Leica S two um, for model photography. Maybe next year I'll pick one up. Um, and every time I've used a phase one back, it's been really nice to use with, say, the Novaflex bellows that I showed you. Um, I keep hoping that a company like Fujifilm or Sony will release a, a back, just a back only, um, because my sort of photography needs a really shallow flange, and these mirrorless cameras don't have near enough shallow a flange to, to work with the lenses that I do. But who knows? <laughs> yeah. Very, very, very interesting and stimulating thoughts. <laughs> well, I can say so. So is there, I wanted to ask you, is there any uh, photographers that is using mirrorless, photographer using mirrorless systems today that you would like to recommend to our audience that is doing interesting work? You know what, um, so my main influences um, in terms of now, I won't say, let's not say influence in terms of my work, but uh, the people that I look at um, as good photographers are um, people, some people use a Leica M. And of course, I think some people debate, is that a mirrorless or not? It is a mirrorless camera, but it's an established mount that's been around for 60 years. Um, there's one car photographer named, sorry, named Christopher L.T. Lung. He's on my Facebook. Um, he is basically like M only, and he does a lot of really great natural light photo uh, photography of cars. Very, very beautiful stuff with old lenses. Um, the sort of thing that's like my photography, but blown up to larger than life size. And then um, there are other people uh, who actually are in the audio, audio world, um, people like Marcus of headphonics.com. Um, that's with an F, not a PH. Um, who do who work really well with artificial light, but not artificial light in a in a flash based way. But he uses a Sony A7. Um, then there's yeah, I mean my influence. A, a lot of the people that I follow and think that that do interesting photography are actually just real geeks. Um, so there, I, I I almost wonder if like if. If, uh, if what I have to say about anything is going to be listened to by anyone. I mean, like, I, I follow geeks. I, I'm, uh, I'm a real geek myself. So the people that shoot stuff, they're shooting headphone amplifiers. They're shooting rims on cars. Um, but those people, are they're using mirrorless cameras, and they're doing wonderful jobs. All right. So I want to thank you for this uh, very interesting conversation. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I want to add, um, I, I, can't, I think it's two weeks ago, I, I posted up, um, it, you were doing some, some uh, interesting stuff with lighthouses. I, when I can, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very, 
I live in Italy, and there aren't that many lighthouses in Italy. But it Not seems that. like that you've, it seems that you've captured a number of really beautiful landscapes or cityscapes with light, lighthouses, and uh, I like. I think it's really it's really wonderful that uh, you're going after sort of a series design on any sort of um, uh, subject. And I think uh, not enough photographers are really going for that sort of serious thing, where they're they're tackling a subject. And uh, I really hope that um, photographers who are using mirrorless cameras will start to tackle things like I do audio stuff. I do I shoot lenses for certain magazines. I shoot lenses for certain manufacturers. Um, photographers should start tackling things that they really really like, and uh, and doing what you're doing. When you can, I mean, you don't always have time to go after what you want to do, but uh, when you have the chance to really shoot what you want to shoot, shoot it. And before you shoot it, decide what you like, and that will really help you, I think, grow as a photographer. Um, and, you know, a lot of these cameras, I think any, any camera, if you pick up an X-T1, you pick up an A7R, yes, one has a, a sensor that's 2.3 times the size, but that if you're printing, I doubt that you'll... As long as, you're, as long as you're shooting the right thing, shooting the right exposure, you'll probably not be able to tell any difference. But um, as long as you're shooting something you like, you'll probably shoot a better photograph than you'll shoot of a leaf because you want to make it look good for someone else to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I appreciate what you're doing with the, with the, uh, the lighthouses especially. It's just, it's just obviously something that, uh, that you're interested in, and it looked great. Yeah, I, I have to confess it's... Um, uh... It's a bit of an opportunistic thing in, in that I I happen to to know some people that they knew some nice lighthouse locations and when I visited the New England I went took a three day trip around Maine the Maine coast which is famous for its lighthouses and then I asked around and and I asked well I'm going to Maine what should I shoot there and people said lighthouses and I said of course <laughs> so, of course. <laughs> So what were you? What so what was okay? Let let's turn the let's turn this conversation around. What what were you using? What what was the equipment that, that kept you kept you going for that? Uh, when I when I went to Maine, I still had my Nikon D ninety as my main camera, That's right. but I had just recently got the Fuji X one hundred S. So I was what I was doing my modus operandi was I would go to a lighthouse like at, at sunrise. To get a good light, I would put the the DSLR on the tripod, find the right locate, the right angle, the right composition, and wait for the light. And while I was waiting for the maybe the sun to come up or the clouds to clear, I would just snap pictures around with the X1 on the desk. When I came okay. back, when I came back home, I had I liked my X1 on the desk pictures better than the ones mm -hmm. taken with the D90. Oh, that's fair enough. I, I think, um, so one thing I noticed about the A7R when I picked it up was the uh, the colors and the exposure were really, really nice uh, versus, now, I'm not going to say that Nikon colors or anything look bad. They always they always look good, but it's just the white balance was better on the Sony, and the Fujifilm tends to have, I think, a little bit, I've had some problems with white balance when I shot. So I shoot sometimes events, and I did uh, British Embassy here. They had like some crazy big wigs from around the world, and uh, the Fuji. Every Fuji film camera that I used had problem with white balance there, but it was really crazy place. Um, but generally, the white balance seems to be very good on some of these mirrorless cameras. Extremely good. Um, so that out of the camera, it just looks pretty much like what I saw with my eyes, which is very nice. One thing that I I liked using the Fuji cameras was shooting directly into the sun. Ah yeah. yes yes. Uh, that that is one of the best things about the the mirrorless camera. I mean, if you have an EVF, you can look literally directly into the sun. That otherwise, if you had a, a DSLR, it would blind you, of course. So that's certainly certainly a huge advantage. Um, I used it when I was um, when I was back in Sweden. In 2011, I did a lot of into the sun shots um, with a DSLR, it was a Nikon D200. Um, but that meant kind of squinting through the viewfinder to decide what I wanted to shoot. And then 
looking away from it, snapping the image, then looking at the LCD and realizing that I probably shouldn't do this very much because I'll go blind. Yeah. Mirrorless is way better for that photo. Yeah, another thing I, I recently went in uh, to Utah uh, and that's a famous and popular spot there which is called Mesa Arch which I'm sure everybody has seen it because uh, a photo of that was used as a, a desktop wallpaper for Windows 7, I think. So, And it's a beautiful location. It's very popular. You go there in the middle of the night and there's 20 photographers already there waiting for sunrise. Because when the sun comes up, it's looking east. There's this small arch, natural arch. And when the sun comes out, it will lighten up the bottom of the arch, which will start glowing a bright orange. So you get right. this. You get the mountains in the background it's it's just beautiful and it's beautiful also if you get the uh, when the sun is hitting the top of the arch so it will start if you close down your stop down your aperture you will get nice starbursts but but you're there you're there with 20 other photographers your options with respect to movement are pretty limited or just okay i want to move two meters to my left no i can't because there's another person there or two meters hmm. to my right. So what I did, I put my camera on the tripod and I waited for the sun to come up. And then I right. use again the X one on the desk to just walk around a bit, move a bit here, just go behind the other photographers, raise the camera to my head and take a shot and maybe up or down freely without being on a tripod to get the sun in the right position and, and so on. And having a small camera helped because I, I could just hold it like that and map. Yes. That with a, I, if I had had a D800 with a, like a 1424 F28, my my hand would be shaking just from the way. It went. Oh, of course, of course. I guess I guess the no, I agree with you. I guess the the counter argument to that is that there is no real equivalent to a 14 to 24 2.8 lens on an APS sensor. You would have to have what like 10 to 16 f2 and the lens would be just as big so but yeah i mean the the, the x100s is tiny well the tiny. nice thing is that for for landscape you don't care much about having f2 no no of course not that doesn't matter at all really i mean so i'm happy uh, with my I recently got the 1024 f4 for yeah for my fuji and it's, uh, it's yeah yeah sense. okay well actually yeah uh, yeah and, and i shoot most of my lenses are really slow it's a 5.6 my fastest lens that I use at work is, yeah, is a 5.6 lens. <laughs> so, and of course they're, they're really tiny. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously speed isn't a big issue for me, but I guess if you're, if you're really into depth of focus and when, and actually, actually I am, um, when I'm not shooting for work, I like things that don't look like everything's in focus. And I think that's probably, probably an artifact of me always shooting everything exactly in focus, using bellows, using camera movements. And so when I get outside and I, and I use a, what used to be a lens that would get lots of out of focus elements on a small sensor and I realize that everything's in focus, it's like, this was a damn expensive lens <laughs> that doesn't do what I, what, I, what I thought it would do. But you know, it's, still, it's still nice to have a small, small camera with these mirrorless for sure. Uh, and Fuji is coming out soon with, uh, I think they have uh, announced uh, the 16 F14, which yeah, is nice, and the 90 F12, which yeah. will probably give you a pretty shallow depth of field if you really want. It looks like a pretty damn large lens, though. It's uh, yeah, the, the 90 F2 is huge. By the way, I, I want to ask you, I guess before before you have to go. Uh, you shoot, so are, are you really into star, a starburst photography? Like with... Uh, uh, if... I like it. I try to, if I can get a good starburst, I really, maybe it's a gimmick sometimes, but... Oh, no, hey, there's no gimmick about it. So uh, do you have a, like a favorite number of aperture blades for the starburst? or Because uh, I do, I just want to know so if you have something like that. The best, I don't have any Fuji lens that gives me yeah. nice starbursts. My best lens for that was the Tokina 11-16 F2.8. Okay. It has a nine straight blades. 
Okay. Yeah, straight blades. Eighteen pointed stars. That was that, that's great. I still have it. I mean, it's a Nikon mount. I can use an adapter and put it on my right. on my Fuji if I want. That, okay. That's great for Starburst. It's uh, very sharp, very defined. Sixteen point, uh, eighteen points of light. They're gorgeous. Okay. Okay. Well, see. So, um, I my favorite was always six or eight, only because I didn't like a lot of points. And then recently, I discovered that a lot of points can sometimes look very, very good. So. I'm starting to learn the Starburst thing, and uh, after looking at your photography, I realize that there are things that certain photographers that are doing that have that are convincing me to think outside of my traditional box of eight points or six points. So yeah, <laughs> I just took what I, I I didn't get that lens specifically for Starburst. I, I had read about it, and some reviewers said that it was um, very nice for that. And I said, yeah, it's, it is, it's not the number of points. It's the fact that the starbursts are, uh, starbursts are very sharp, very well, very clean, very well defined. And you get no strange colored flares and so on. Whereas I get a lot of that with my the 35-1.4 or even the 23 uh, F2 lens on the X100S, and you point it straight into the sun, and you get uh, flare uh, color effects. You get sometimes you get strange, uh, strange checkered pattern of colors. Ah, uh, yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah, what is that? That's really awful. I don't know. It's uh, it's the lens. <laughs> it's horrible. You, you cannot fix it. I mean, I mean, if you are very good at Photoshop and yeah. And you know what you're doing. Maybe you can fix it, but it's probably a ton of work. So you gotta be careful. You, you get that a lot with uh, with some Fuji lenses. No, I, I noticed that um, actually. I wonder if that has to do with the checkered pattern. I wonder if that has to do a little bit with the sensor. I had some problems with the Nikon D D two hundred as well with some sort of checkered pattern um, with direct photographs into the sun. And I noticed that same with my X Pro one hundred or X Pro one and XT1, so it must be either something with a Sony sensor or some sort of, listen, I don't know what it is, I'm not, I'm not an engineer, but, but if you like, if you like flare and you don't mind that the lens isn't completely tack sharp, wide open, but gives a little bit of a nice softer, but still Micro contrasty image, the Pen F sixty one point five. Yes, it's six hundred dollars or seven hundred dollars, but it's going to still remain that price in twenty years. Great lens for Fujifilm or APS cameras. Why? Main reason is because on the lens here, uh, right here, sorry, there's a stop down function. So you set your lens to f four, and if you'll notice. The lens, uh, I don't know if you can see. So the lens is stayed wide open. When you press this button, it stops down. Yeah. So if you're in the habit of using um, uh, adapted lenses, most of the time, if you set the aperture to f1.4, it's always like this. So when you focus, you can't. Uh, it's always more accurate to focus wide open because the the plane of focus. Is, is, is obviously more shallow, so you know exactly where you're focusing. But if you're focusing through a stop-down lens, then you have to focus wide open, then stop down, and that takes a little bit of time. With the, with the Pen F lenses, you literally can focus wide open and then stop down, uh, and it takes no more time than you would just use a regular lens like this on its native mount. Um, so I, I used uh, the Keepen, Keepen Pen FX, uh, adapter. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, um, but I like. I don't like to invest in cheap stuff because I. There, we could go into it long time. But I took out. There is a little arm here that stops the aperture arm from closing down, or causes it to close down. I removed that so that I can use the lens as it would be. So I can. It would stop down. The lens itself would stop down. Otherwise, it would. It would always stop the lens down. Yeah. So I removed that, and now I can use it as it would normally, and it's. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough with, the, with these Pen F lenses that I will probably 
get rid of all my Nikon lenses because I can stop them down and use them like I would use normally on their native mount. Cool. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. we, we, went, we went a bit on a tangent, I think. Yeah, oh, of course. We, we love this discussion. At least I loved it. I mean, it, it's been a, a great discussion. We went a bit uh, outside of the of the typical conversation about mirrorless cameras, about that. But that's because I think you're a geek and so am I, so whatever. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's true. Oh. Okay, so uh, thanks again very much for being our guest today. Uh, people who want to, to follow you, they can go to, can you just, they can see your website URL in the... Yes, that's correct. You, but you, can, you want to, to say that again, but we will add any pointers to to your online presence uh, to the show notes. But yeah, I so uh, find you. Uh, yeah, so please, uh, if if you're if you're a geek, I mean, if if you're a geek, uh, an audio geek, a camera geek, but you're you're kind of like really into the the geeky 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 stuff. Um, not necessarily the benchmark stuff, but just kind of you're just a geek that doesn't fit in with other places. Please come and read my site, Om Image, which is O H M dash i m a g e dot net um i'd be happy you know just i i i've disabled comments etc because i don't want it to be a community thing but i but i but the website is there it's not us it's not a, a money-making website there's no sponsor or anything but please come check it out and if you happen to manufacture that wants your stuff to look good <laughs> that's what i do for a living mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah and I'm Nathan Wright, yeah. Yeah, um, are you on Facebook, Twitter? I am on Facebook. I think that, I think if you go to omimage.net, then you can check out somewhere my Facebook or my Twitter. I don't know exactly what they're called off the top of my head, but there's something like that. I, I, I think I screwed up on Twitter. I think it is ohm underscore image, where it should have been dash, but I make mistakes like that. Like I said, I. I drink a lot. That could be the problem. It's possible that you cannot have a dash in your in your name on Twitter. Maybe. It and also could be possible that I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks again, and uh, have a nice uh, night. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, you know, I had originally, eventually, I want you to, if you can ever come on. Omer podcast uh, just to talk tragically, but I really like this one. Your uh, your format is great. Uh, your guests are great, um, and I think you're doing a great job of sort of collecting a lot of um, incredibly important voices through the industry, um, both geeks and performers and photographers, and you yourself are kind of all of those. So it's great to be here. Thank you very much. And you're welcome. Goodbye. Good evening. <laughs>